Thank you, thank you. All right, well, let's see. Go ahead. Does this, this sound like it's on? Okay. I'm, I'm here to talk about uh, the differences between the 17025 and the 17020 standards. Uh, 17025, obviously, for calibration, testing, dimensional laboratories. Um, 17020 for inspection bodies. There's a tremendous amount of overlap between these standards. And let's talk about some simple examples. Every one of us uses an iPad, an iPhone, a laptop. Um, one of the things that we've seen over the last few years is that there's been a lot of counterfeiting of the chips that are used in these uh, devices. Uh, if you've got a laptop, you've got an Intel iCore 7, iCore 5, those types of chips. You see it advertised on the laptop itself. Those chips start out and they're, they're clocked by the manufacturer. They all start out as a, an i7 and then they're clocked to see how they perform. Then they get downgraded. Okay, this one only performs at this level, so it's an i5. This one should be a core three. This one, okay, it clocks at this level. Well, one of the things that we started noticing happening about 10 years ago was that there was a lot of counterfeiting of these parts. Uh, we had a particular problem coming out of Southeast Asia uh, with electronics manufacturers. So an industry sprung up around this to do what's called decapsulization of parts. And we had a number of, in, of testing laboratories, uh, one in particular down in Houston, which specialized using scanning electron microscopes, using inspection devices, and what they would do is they would actually peel back the top layer of chip products to see if somebody had gone in, painted over the surface, and printed a new sticker on the top. Because the higher your chipset quality is, the higher, the higher profit margin you can build into it, and the more people are going to pay for it. The higher chipset quality uh, also uh, becomes allocated, meaning that only so many people can get these chips. What we've seen happen in the last couple years is that folks are going away from being testing laboratories and dimensional houses that are doing this, and they're becoming inspection, lab inspection bodies to do the inspection. Because the difference between 17025 is you're producing a dimensional result, a testing result. With 17020, you're really going with product knowledge. You're saying, yes, this is conforming. No, this is not conforming. And it's based a lot on professional judgment. So that's part of the difference. One of the things we'll talk about, why, why do inspection bodies get assessed? What's the value to it? What are some of the differences between 17025 and 17020? And what are the benefits of getting this accreditation as an inspection body? Because all the places out there say, OK, well, I've got qualified inspectors. I can give you the results of my professional judgment. I can, whether I'm looking at oil and gas pipelines, whether I'm looking at chipsets, whether I'm looking at construction techniques in New York City, what are the benefits of being accredited by an, by an accreditation body? OK, what we've seen with 17025 is in the last 12 years, there's been tremendous growth around the world since the 2005 standard came out. Huge expansion of the base for testing. Uh, it's been incorporated. Uh, part of DOD ELAP, Department of Defense Environmental Lab Accreditation Program, they have built their, cer their certification system on 17025. It's also been done by NELAC, the National Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Council. They've used that as a basis for their accreditations. Uh, but what we've seen is that 17025, any of you who have looked at the new standard that's uh, going to be coming out this, the end of this year, next year, that'll be following the uh, ISO 9001 format, been, how many revisions has that been through? Seven or eight over the last uh, eight years? Yeah. How many times has it been voted down? It's been very slow to change and to adapt, and there's, there's good reasons for that. Uh, it's been very resistive to new interpretations in 17025, 
and it uh, obviously it doesn't follow the current ISO 9000 format. What is it? It follows the the 2003 version. Yeah. So, okay. The difference with 17020, you know, the latest version, it went from 2008 to the 2012 version. Um, we've seen phenomenal growth in inspection bodies uh, over the last three years. We expect, uh, we expect that this is going to continue to grow. And this is because inspection bodies are based primarily on professional judgment. Does this qualify? Does this, in, does this uh, building conform to building codes? Are these boilers and pressure vessels adequate? Does this work for you? Um, I think that the next 10 years is really going to change what we know of in the accreditation world. You know, the accreditation bodies, ANAB, HLA, PJ, NAVLAP, all the groups that you see in North America, DAX, CNAS, SINA, you know, around the world, those groups, we're going to see a move away from 17025. Not that we're going to see less organizations accredited with 17025, but we're going to see a tremendous explosion in 17020. We are seeing uh, applications come in from all different types of industries right now. Uh, we're, dealing with, uh, we're dealing with boiler pressure vessel inspections. We're dealing with uh, oil and gas. We're dealing with building construction. We're dealing with soil compaction. All things that have to pass professional judgment. And 17 to 20 has proven to be very open to interpretation. Okay, an overview. Um, ANAB, ANSI, ASQ, National Accreditation Body. So ASQ is, is part owner of uh, ANAB, just in case nobody knew that. This area uh, on the left-hand side, lab-related, that's what most people think of when you're dealing with uh, 17025 and 17020. But it also deals with, in the center column, it deals with forensics, uh, crime scene labs, state crime labs, forensic capability. Uh, and it also deals with certification bodies. Just, just an overview for you. Okay. When we talk about ISO, and this applies whether you're dealing with 17025 or 17020, 17065, you know, proficiency testing, uh, reference material providers, ILAC is at the top. Yes, it's an ISO standard. Yes, it's uh, presented and put together by ISO in Geneva, Switzerland. In the, what is it, 157 voting countries that each have a vote? Um, but ILAC is a group that puts together, here's how it's going to be implemented. Accreditation bodies, here's how you're going to implement these two standards. Uh, down from there, you get to APLAC, the Asia Pacific Laboratory Accreditation Council, and the Inter-America Cooperative. <coughs> then it goes down to the representative accreditation bodies. ANAB, HLA, PJ, NAVLAP, et cetera. All those groups that you're familiar with. Then it goes down to the accreditation body customers, the labs, the inspection bodies that are seeking accreditation. So that's how this whole process works. It doesn't matter whether it's 17025, whether it's 17020. Okay, when we look at, at inspection, we look back at the history of inspection. Um, and you, you can read through this. I don't need to read off this process. 120 years ago, the main source of industrial accidents in the, in the U United States were boiler and pressure vessel explosions. That is still one of the primary areas for inspection bodies today is certification of boiler and pressure vessels. Uh, boilers, any building that has more than three or four units is going to have a boiler and pressure vessel that has to be inspected on an, on an annual basis. Okay. Um, ISO guide 39, those are the, re the general requirements that we have to follow for inspection bodies for uh, inspection. Uh, there's also ISO guide 57. Okay. What is an inspection body? Okay. It's an impartial body having the organization staffing confidence, blah, blah, blah. Basically, what we're looking for as an accreditation body, when we look at inspection bodies, 
Do they have the personnel? Do they have the capacity? Do they have the traceability in the devices that they use, the instruments that they use? And do they, have, do they comply with local regulatory requirements? So 17020 in that respect is very similar to what you're talking about with ISO 17025. The difference is you're not present in 17025, you're presenting here's a pass fail. Here is the, here's the, uh, the tensile test results. Here are the dimensional results. With 17020, the difference is that you're saying whether a system works, whether it complies with the regulations that have been put in place. We have, a, we have groups uh, over in Brunei that are doing oil and gas inspections. What are they looking at? They're doing ultrasonic inspection of welds. They're doing inspection of coating of uh, pipeline delivery systems. We've got uh, groups up in uh, the five boroughs of New York that are doing inspection of construction guidelines, uh, how, how construction techniques are applied. Those are not things that fall under 17025. <clears throat> okay, when we talk about this, what are some of the differences? Testing, determination of a characteristic. What is a physical property? Um, when we look at, uh, at inspection, the procedure is, are we carrying out an activity in a specific way? Are we following the process for how this item should be put together? Testing, yeah, it typically applies to materials. It applies to dimensional, it applies to products. The, the presentation that we just saw from Sterrett Bitewise, that's looking at inspection of materials, inspections of that process. But when we look at inspection, we're looking at how products are put together. We're looking at how things work together. So it's a, it's a different thing. Now, inspection activities, yeah, do they overlap with testing and calibration? Yeah, they do. Uh, the biggest difference is most types of inspections are going to involve some type of professional judgment. Okay, when we look at inspection, there are really three types that we go back and we look at. New products. Um, we're also, this also applies to forensic inspection. You know, when we're looking at crime scenes, when we're looking at placement of items. Uh, we're looking at periodic inspection. When we talked about the, uh, the oil and gas inspections in Brunei, what we're talking about is how are the gas well pumps working? How are they operating? What are the points of wear? Are they seeing uh, high cyclic fatigue? Uh, on the welds. That's the type of inspection we're looking at there. And then pre-shipment inspection. Uh, we see this uh, around the world. Uh, this can be for marking of products. It can be for quantity. It can be for uh, type. Uh, give you a couple examples. Uh, I was in the southern part of uh, Russia in Novorossiysk back in March. Not a good place to go. <coughs> And we were looking at uh, <coughs> inspection of grain shipments and inspection of sunflower and canola oil, inspection of those prior to being loaded. We've got a, there's an inspection body down in Miami that I visited uh, a couple weeks ago that is doing inspection of shredded steel that's going to India and to China for smelters. Cars that we've uh, ground up and need to be smelted back. What are they looking for? They're looking for quantity, they're looking for general overall quality of the material, and they're looking for radio, radioactive, radioactive background. They're not looking for specific uh, quantities, they're not looking for specific uh, dimensions. Yes, those are being reported in terms of the, the tonnage being shipped, the percentage of what they call fluff being shipped, and the radioactive background, but it's a general judgment of, does this meet the criteria for shipment? Okay. We're also seeing uh, one of the areas, there are a lot of inspection bodies that are qualified by area of the world that they go into. Um, give you one specific example. We have a lot of 
items that are being transshipped into Pakistan, Afghanistan, et cetera. We're not sending inspectors in there. We're not sending assessors in there. But what we're doing is we're qualifying uh, shops that operate in Dubai and the United Arab Emirates. And they uh, do the inspections in bonded warehouses. Um, we've all heard about bonded warehouses and bonded warehouse districts. You can bring the product in there, transship it, inspect it, apply the inspection body certificate, and then ship it in a sealed container to a third country. That is a lot of the inspection body activity that we're seeing today. Okay. Inspection, examination of product, design, product service. Um, the biggest thing is the results of this inspection may be used to support certification that's being done. Okay. What are we looking at in inspection? We're looking at uh, examination of the product design. Is it the proper type that's represented on the paperwork? We're looking at the drawings. When we're looking at pressure vessels, we're looking at uh, what type of weldment, what type of x-ray has to be performed. Has it been done by a certified body? Has, it been, has the process been done in the proper sequence? Looking at material characteristics. <coughs> Was the proper steel used? Was it heat treated properly? That's what an inspection body is looking for. Uh, we're looking at the planned installations, those types of things. Okay. We're also looking at, during initial inspection, uh, we're looking at uh, testing against the requirements. Was the proper metrological testing done? Was the proper weldment inspection done? Under periodic inspection, if you think about uh, PM inspections, uh, preventive maintenance, this is very much like that, but it's applied on an inspection basis. Um, you think about uh, doing, a, doing your annual inspection on a car. You think about the checklist that's done, uh, your pre-flight inspection on an airplane or a helicopter. Very similar, making sure that those things are done. This is what an inspection body performs and qualifies. Service, is service being performed properly? Is the process that we're going through, is that being performed properly? Welding procedures, soldering procedures, those types of things. Okay. Maybe we're looking at uh, installation. Boiler and pressure vessel is a great example of this. Uh, has it been installed properly? Are the relief valves in the proper uh, sequence? Uh, has it been tested on an annual basis? Um, <coughs> those types of things. Um, determination of conformity with uh, legal requirements. We actually don't see a lot of that. Um, but general requirements on the basis of professional judgment. Uh, we see this a lot uh, when we're following up behind uh, civil engineering projects. Uh, how have uh, how have buildings been constructed? How have roadways been laid down? Has pavement been uh, compacted to the proper level? Uh, we see that uh, quite a bit. All right, now one of the things, I thought it was really interesting when we were talking with, uh, with David Butler in the keynote uh, presentation this morning. And he was talking about one of the problems we're seeing is the number of auditors and the number of assessors that are going to be needed. We've been able to take a very different approach as an accreditation body with recruiting assessors for 17020 versus 17025. When you think about 17025 and 17020, both of those standards require that anybody that goes into these fields and does assessments has to have background and competency. They have to have what are called competency codes. They have to show, if they're going in and they're looking at dimensional testing, they have to have run dimensional tests, they have to understand the equipment, they have to have the uh, technical aptitude and background to understand that. What that's meant in 17025 in many cases is that uh, we get 
people who are at the end of their careers, who are retiring, who want to then go out and do a couple days a month, you know, a couple days a week of assessing. And that gives us one group of assessors. <coughs> we are taking a completely different approach with 17020. 17020, we're finding that the Gen Xers and the Millennials are our source, which, which sounds counterintuitive, but they think differently than, than us old guys do. And the base of our assessor core is primarily coming out of women, which is completely different than what you see in 17025 assessors. What we're finding is that we get people that have been in the workforce. They've got the technical background that we require. They've been in the workforce 10 to 12 years, maybe a little less, maybe a little more. And we're finding that they've gone as far as they can in that field. They've got the knowledge, they've got the expertise, but they want more flexibility. And what we're finding is that in many cases these people, uh, you know, it's husband, wife, two kids, and one of them keeps a steady job and the other one says, hey, I'm gonna go out and be a 17 or 20 assessor. And it's gonna give, it's gonna give me flexibility it's going to give me the capability to do this, and it's going to expand my professional environment. That's the difference that, that we're seeing as an accreditation body. There's a completely different assessor pool, and that kind of surprised us. And this has happened probably in the last 18 months. And that is the, that's the base that uh, we see we're going to, we're going to uh, pursue going forward. We see that as our success model. And I think that's going to happen with all the accreditation bodies. Um, and I don't know what we're going to do about 17025 because we're not seeing that same, that same assessor pool come forward. Even though you think it would be the same, it's not. OK. Um, is there a borderline between inspection, certification, and testing? Yeah, of course there is. Um, Testing is well defined and the result of testing is a value. Here's a number that you've got. Okay. Certification is a comparison of that result with what the standard requires. Okay. And inspection is a professional judgment based on those two things. Does it meet? So it requires, it requires a little bit more thought process, not process. And I think that's what's appealing to, to the Gen Xers. I really do. You know, and it, it's, been, it's been surprising to us. Um, definitions. You guys don't need to know definitions. You know what accreditation is. You know what an accreditation body is. You know, ANAB, A2LA, DAX, CNAS, etc. And an expert is simply somebody who flies in from somewhere else. Um, you know what first party, second party, and third party audits are. Third party audits are what we as an accreditation body do. We have no financial uh, relationship with you, no business relationship with you other than to provide that attestation that you've got the personnel, you've got the people, you've got the processes in, in place and you're able to demonstrate it. Okay, accreditation versus conformity. Um, as an accreditation body, what are we doing? We're, we are assessing the competency you know, of what's called a CAB, a conformity assessment body. And that's whether you're a dimensional lab, whether you're a testing lab, whether you're uh, doing calibration, or whether you're an inspection body. Or if you're a reference material provider, a proficiency testing provider, we're looking and we're assessing the competency. Now, conformity is what, is what inspection bodies or dimensional measurement or testing laboratories perform. That is assessing conformity. And that's, that's really the only difference. Okay. Now, overall, we talked, we talked a little bit earlier. ILAC is at the top. They implement all the requirements of ISO. Uh, we've got APLAC, we've got the Inter-America Cooperative. We've also got the EA, which uh, quite honestly, in the last 10 years, I don't think I've seen much come out of the EA. 
it's, uh, <coughs> it's surprisingly a toothless body. But we've got under these, we've got all these organizations, accreditation bodies, which comply with, with both of the requirements there. That's the hierarchy, and this applies whether it's ISO 17025 for dimensional and testing laboratories, or ISO 17020 for inspection bodies. All right, things that we look at, welding, yes, uh, assembly inspections for oil and gas, yes, boiler and pressure vessel, building code, that's huge in uh, New York City right now. Elevator and escalator permitting. NFPA, National Fire Protection uh, Association, that area in the last 12 months has blown up. That has gone through the roof. We're seeing <coughs> There's never been, there's, there's, a, there's a patchwork of fire protection statutes across the, uh, across the nation. Okay. There's a patchwork of those, and ostensibly it's ruled by the National Fire Protection Association, NFPA. Uh, but none of those bodies have in the past achieved inspection body accreditation. A lot of them have gone through and done 17025 for testing laboratories. But from the NFPA standpoint, that is, are you, does this fire door uh, resist uh, intrusion for eight hours? Does this damper shut down when it reaches above a certain temperature? But the inspection of those has not been accredited in the past. What we found was about uh, 18, 18, 20 months ago, we had a number of uh, uh, bodies that are doing this inspection saying, hey, we need somebody to come in and say that we are qualified. We're operating to NFPA standards. And we went in and we started qualifying these groups based upon the 17020 standard. It is eminently flexible. 17020 gives you the ability to do that. Magnetic particle inspection, ultrasonic testing, visual inspection. Uh, we're seeing a lot in shipping and port transit qualifications. We're seeing a tremendous amount of that. When you look at, uh, when you, I don't know if, if any of you go through the ports of Long Beach, Miami, Savannah, Philadelphia, Seattle. If you go through any of those and you look at the container ships that are not only shipping into North America, but the things that are going out. What's the, what happens on each one of those uh, 20 foot, 40 foot, 40 foot high cube containers? There's an inspection that's performed prior to the loading of those containers. There's an inspection that's performed during the loading of those containers. There's a seal that's applied to the containers that if broken, the, the, the shipment is void. Um, those all fall under 17020 inspection body requirements. Coating thickness and deposition. You would think, hey, that's, that's really just uh, something that should be done under a testing laboratory. No. What we're looking at here is, for example, in, the, uh, in pipeline construction. Uh, yes, people go out and they, uh, they're producing uh, oil pipelines. One of the things that has to happen to those is there has to be a corrosion resistant coating applied to them. It has to be applied during the, uh, during the heated process. There's a variety of steps that have to go on. Part of the inspection of that falls under 17020 inspection bodies. Okay. ILAC has de defined a whole series of areas that fall under 17020 inspection. Some of the ones that, that you might not think of agricultural products. That's what we were talking about before. Grain deliveries, oil, canola. This applies to alcohol deliveries. It applies to all of those types of shipments. <coughs> um, crane inspection. There's a huge subset of category uh, for uh, fire equipment, fire safety equipment, uh, meaning you know, hook and ladder trucks. There are there are certification bodies and inspection groups uh, around the country that do, th that do the testing of fire safety equipment for individual counties, districts, parishes. 
those fall under ISO 17020 as inspection bodies. Um, other things. This is interesting. You'd say printed products, uh, card, card stock envelopes. Um, there's an organization over in uh, Dunguan, China that uh, does all the manufacturing of most of the cards we see for Hallmark. Uh, they, have, they have a testing laboratory. There's also an inspection body that comes in and oversees everything they do. Inspects how are they, uh, how are they testing for glue sales. How are they uh, checking uh, printed card stock? How are they checking for envelope uh, quality? That's part of what an inspection body can do. Uh, we're also seeing here subsurface soil compaction. Uh, that's part of building codes. And we're starting to see groups that need to have inspection body accreditation for that, particularly in high density areas. If you think about some of the buildings that have failed because of uh, lack of proper soil preparation, we're not talking about the testing of it. We're talking about has this process been followed through properly. When you look at the uh, building design requirements, were these, were these steps taken? Okay. Um, when we look at 17020, one of the things that we have had to be very specific, and this has come out of <coughs> an interpretation from ILAC, 17020 inspection body scopes of accreditation are very specific on where you can perform the inspections. Very specific. Where, as, because what we found early on was that uh, organizations, if we gave them inspection body accreditation, uh, they would say, oh, okay, so we can do vessel transshipment inspections. Okay, we're good to do that around the world. Now, we have to be very specific about where do they have inspectors qualified, where are they allowed to operate. So if you look at, uh, if you look at uh, any of the, uh, any of the uh, scopes of accreditation, and you should look for this if you're dealing with inspection bodies, be very, look in the fine print. Find out, are they approved to operate in India? Are they approved to operate in North America? Are they approved to operate in Peru? Are they approved to operate in the European theater? Those, those scopes of accreditation must be very specific as to where they're allowed to operate because we as an inspect, we as an accreditation body have to go out <coughs> and ensure that the personnel in those areas have been trained, have the background, have the capability. Uh, we, have an, we have an inspection body that's based in uh, Geneva. They have an office in Dubai. They have an office in Singapore. They have an office in Buenos Aires. And they cover different specific regions. <coughs> in, our, uh, in our accreditation of them uh, this past year, I believe we went out and reviewed inspectors in nine different countries as part of their annual accreditation. That is one of the reasons that we're very specific about where they can operate. We're looking at, are they applying the criteria the same? Are they looking at this properly? We had a, uh, a laboratory uh, in Beirut that uh, recently wanted to add uh, 17020 inspection for products that are being transshipped from Lebanon uh, to other parts of the Middle East. And we had to be very specific about where they're qualified to perform those inspections, what type of labeling, what type of uh, requirements they have to have in place. So much more so than in 17025. In 17025, <coughs> when you have a scope of accreditation, it might say that you're doing inspections on site at your primary facility. It might say that you're doing, uh, you're performing that testing or dimensional inspection out at a customer location, or it might specify that you're doing it at a third party location. With inspection bodies, almost everything that you're doing is going to be out remotely. Surprisingly, one of the big differences and one of the things that if I try to bring assessors over from the 17025 of the house to 17020, 
the thing that, that they have trouble wrapping their minds around, the biggest thing they have trouble with, is that the majority of that, of that assessment is going to be conducted at some weird site. It's not going to be conducted in the main offices of the, uh, the company performing inspection. They're going to be out in the field. Um, they may conduct all the documentation there. We find that uh, at least 50% of the 17020 inspection bodies, the, ass the assessments never go in and look at the home offices because everything can be done via the web. This may also be one of the reasons that the Gen Xers and the Millennials are drawn into this. They're not looking through traditional paperwork. They're looking at what's the documentation, what's the background, how do you put this together? <coughs> we talked about this. Okay, one of the things that, that just as in 17025, inspection bodies can do inspection outside their scope of accreditation. Um, they just have to, they just have to very clearly say, hey, this is not covered by our accredited scope. We've not been looked at by an accreditation body to do this. Same thing with uh, 17025 houses. They're free to do testing outside of their scope of accreditation. They just have to put an asterisk by it, saying, hey, this is not part of our scope of accreditation. It's not an accredited result. Same thing there. Okay. 17020 outline. Obviously, this follows the standard ISO 9000 format. This is what uh, hopefully 17025 will follow in the beginning of next year when we all go through this uh, wonderful transition. <coughs> One of the things that you see is this option A and option B. Basically, option A is if you don't have an ISO 9001 system in place already. Option B is, hey, we've already got an ISO 9001 system in place that we're accredited to. Give us some credit for this. Now, as an assessment body, are we going to take a look at all those other pieces? Yes, we're not dummies. You know, some days we are. But you know, we, we try to operate professionally. If you've got an ISO 9001 accredited system, you know, a registered system, <coughs> we're not going to look uh, at, to the same level or depth that we would under option A, where we're, where we're required to look at all those pieces of the system and validate them. Okay. The requirements on impartiality and independence uh, for inspection activities, yes, this is critical. Uh, we'll talk. We'll talk a little bit about this. There's type A, type B, and type C. Type A is what we see primarily. Type A is a third-party inspection body, meaning that it's completely independent of the folks that it's looking at. Um, that's the most common group that we see. They're contracted with by, uh, you know, Shell Oil, BP. Uh, they're contracted with by transshipment companies to come in and provide certification that what they're shipping adheres to the requirements. Okay? That's what we see most often. There are type Bs. These are uh, in-house inspection bodies. They're associated with the group, but they're not, they're, they're not involved in design, manufacture, in any way. This is, this is one of the areas where we have to show that there's a complete fire, firewall between these, between these organizations. If they can show that, we're happy to accredit them as an inspection body, but it's specific. They've got that relationship with the organization. And then type Cs, these are, these are inspection bodies that are truly commingled within an organization. Um, but we have, maybe they're, maybe they're dealing with design, maybe they're dealing with manufacture, but we have to show that whoever in that body is performing inspection uh, operates on an independent basis. <coughs> we, see, we see very few type Cs. Um, the reason being is I can tell you that every single one of the group, groups that has come in and has tried to apply to be a type C has been unable to show that, uh, that clear separation. That's, that's really difficult. So type A's are probably 95% of what we see. Type B's are probably about 5%. Type C's are virtually non-existent. 
Okay. When we, you look at the, the option A or B in ISO 17020, this looks exactly like ISO 9000. Looks exactly like the requirements. It's by design. Okay. When we look at uh, the requirements out here, we've got uh, the ILAC P15 requirements. Okay. This basically says, okay, we're providing information for, for use by both the accreditation body, that's us, ANAB, A2LA, all those good guys, and the inspection bodies on how to apply 17020. It's published by ILAC, and it's mandatory. You have to, you have to comply with ILAC P15 as an inspection body. It's not optional. Okay. This is the big thing we come back to, impartiality. If a risk to impartiality is identified, inspection body has to actively show how they minimize that risk to impartiality. They have to be able to demonstrate that. That's one of the things as, <coughs> as an accreditation body that we're going to continue to look at and we're con con going to continue to drive with our assessors. Um, an inspection body having top management commitment to impartiality, yes, uh, that's no different in any respect from 17025. Okay. All right. Um, nah. Okay. Questions that you all have about uh, this presentation. You know, the, the difference between 17025 as testing laboratories, dimensional inspection, calibration houses, and 17020 as inspection bodies. They're very different beasts, but they operate in the same world. Questions? So you mentioned about um, qualifications of personnel, et cetera, and I thought, uh, for example, 9001 was very specific about certain people, and I think that's what you were talking about with the, the, 17, the inspection bodies, having those people qualified correctly. I, is that a fair assumption that they're pretty much the same? It is, a, it is a fair assumption. Um, those things are, are driven by ISO 17011 and ISO 19011, uh, the requirements for inspection body or requirements for accreditation bodies. The difference that, that we're seeing is that, as, a, as I talked about before, with 17025, um, it's been unusual for us to uh, have people who uh, early in their career, relatively early in their career, say, hey, this is a path I, I want to go down as an assessor. Um, I've got the qualifications. I've got, I've got, you know, I've been in a wet chem lab for 10 years, and I've got my background in HPLC or GCMS. I understand how to do distillations, those types of things. We really don't see a lot of people that uh, come out of that field for whatever, for out of dimensional, out of testing, out of calibration, and say, hey, I'd like to go assess to these things. Um, it's more at the end of their career that, that we tend to see that. But with 17020, we're seeing a, we're seeing a much higher jump over. We're seeing, uh, because it involves not just uh, looking at how things are tested, not just looking at how things are calibrated. We're seeing people that say, okay, this requires my ability to interpret how these results are being done, how these things are being put together. And we're seeing a whole different cadre of, of assessors that are coming over. Yes, they've got the qualifications. Yes, they've got the background. And maybe they've worked in these areas. You know, uh, Maybe I've got somebody that's a... Uh, a level three, you know, uh, radiographic inspector. Maybe I've got somebody that uh, has a has a certain background in uh, soil compaction. Maybe I've got somebody that's worked in ultrasonic testing in uh, the oil and gas field. 
and they, I'm finding that those people are much more willing to cross over and say, hey, I'd really like to, to do this. It's been a, it doesn't mean they're, they're any less qualified. They've got to have the same level of competency as an accreditation body. We have to demonstrate that. But uh, yeah, we're, it's, it's, it's very strange. Okay. Uh, um, another little follow-up here. Um, <coughs> the inspection bodies, I believe, based on your comments, are specific to location. Again, similar to 9001. Uh, example, Bechtel Engineering, Houston, Texas office mm -hmm. is qualified to 9001 in engineering. Mm -hmm. But not Bechtel in Malaysia, that Correct. office. So it's very specific. Is that not true for inspection? It is bodies? very specific to the office, but it can also be, for example, if you took Bechtel in Houston and we were looking at them to do perform inspections, we would also say, okay, this office is qualified to perform inspections in the continental U.S. They're qualified to perform assessments in Central America. They are qualified in these specific countries in South America. So it's you could actually that could be part of the certification. Then is that, that right? Is, that is part of the ah, scope of accreditation. We uh, we parse it down to a very fine level. Okay, and just a minor comment. I did see a fireproof door at my church, and it had the NF. PA on it, a yes. sticker, okay? It's called a fire, co fire code safety rating. Okay, so the, the door is certified, mm -hmm. but we didn't have an inspector check the door, or whatever it is. I was trying to get the difference okay. there. Well, give me, give me, let's be very specific about okay. a fire safety door. That NFPA fire safety rating uh, is applied based upon somebody's gone out and they've put a flamethrower against the door and seen, okay, it takes three hours for the flamethrower to burn through to the other side. And they apply a sticker based upon that, uh, that testing, okay? Right. That's, that's part of what a testing body, uh, testing lab will do. And they met the requirements right. of whatever that NFPA requirement Correct. was. Now, what an inspection body would do is they would come out and they'd say, okay, we've got a three-hour uh, door here. Let's check how they put the hinges on here. Let's check how they did the closure. Did they, did they put the closure on so that it does not penetrate through the door, which provides a passage for uh, fire intrusion? Is, are the seals applied with a maximum eighth inch gap around all seals on the door? Is it hung properly? Does it automatically engage a, uh, a safety bar mm -hmm. when it does it require a certain type of push? That's what an inspection body will do. They'll come out and they'll look at that. And they'll also look at that uh, sticker and say, gee, is the sticker s still visible? Does it, uh, do, can, can somebody go and look and say, oh, yeah, this is, this is rated for such and such a door? Yeah. That's the difference uh, in that particular case between a, a testing for fire safety door and inspection body for fire safety. Thank Two. you, David. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. I think this question might be a bit off topic and, and maybe below your expertise, but I know you know the answer, so I'm going to ask it anyway. So we're from a, a small organization where all things quality, inspection, testing, QA, QC, everything is under one umbrella, one department with really blurry lines between all of those concepts. And so just to, to ask you to weigh in on what would be the first division that, that, that you would make in such an organization between the different realms of quality? First thing is, is show whoever's, whoever's got that quality responsibility, who do they ultimately report into? That's, that's the very first thing. If somebody's making a, a quality decision, whether it's inspection, whether it's uh, you know, looking at something dimensional, whether it's passing a product, can they be countermanded by somebody else? It's a classic case of can production countermand what the quality guy says. If the quality guy says this is not up to par and the, the sales or the manufacturing can say, no, we need to ship this product, we don't care, then that shows that they don't have the level of independence. They have to be able to show that, that they cannot be ruled over by anyone other than the top of the organization. Does that, does that help? And it, it's, 
When we talk about, several times during the presentation, we talked about independence. That's what it comes back to. Independence and impartiality. Okay. All right. Any, yes, sir. Uh, this could be really baseline estimates, but how many companies in North America would you say are already qualified for 17025, and in a given year, how many think apply? I'd say there, there are at least 6,000 organizations uh, to 17025. I mean, I, I look at, uh, I, I, I'm trying to think, uh, HLA is the big dog. They've got about, uh, they've got about uh, what is it, 2,300 organizations. Um, please? SPS. SPS. Yeah. Um, ANAB has about 1,500. Um, just a general, yeah. Uh, I know that we see uh, from the ANAB side, we'll see uh, we'll see normally several hundred organizations apply a year. That doesn't mean that they successfully go through the process. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Anybody has any question? Okay. Thank you, David. Let's Thank give you very a round much. Of I appreciate everyone.